So yes, I'd like to need to speak about Einstein's effective viscosity formula. So that's a joint work with Mitya Dürings in Brussels. So first I'd like to tell you a story and then I I will try to do some math. So the story is why, so what is the ancient uh, formula and why? And so the story started with the Avogadro number. So the Avogadro number is typically the number of particles, the number of atoms you have in a given, uh, given piece of, uh, of material, if you like. And so at the beginning of the 20th century, there was still this debate whether the nature of matter was atomistic or not. And um, so in 1920-something, in so Jean Perrin made the kind of gathering of all the experiments which would uh, give an approximation of the Avogadro number. We had 23 of them, and they all uh, coincided with, uh, within a margin of 10%. 23 completely different uh, settings where you could identify the Agovogandro number. And one of them was actually inspired by uh, some experiments suggested by Einstein in his PhD thesis. And what I like very much about that example is the fact that he suggested a way to measure the Avogadro number just by measuring the viscosity of a fluid. So if you think about it, five minutes, you realize that you're talking about atoms, right? So the discrete nature of matter, and what you're doing is you're taking just continuum mechanics. You measure things, you know, you have water, a viscometer, you know, something which is nothing but nothing atomistic at all, and then you get an approximation of it. That's just crazy, right? And so why? So that's the question, so why? So how did he do? Uh, the the idea is the following. So you take a tank, so that would be a viscometer, if you like. But for me, it's a square. You have water. OK, you neglect inertia, whatever. And then at the end, you have a linear Stokes equation. OK, first approximation. Then you put sugar. You dissolve sugar in your water. Okay, the sugar changes the viscosity of the fluid. Why? Because you can interpret sugar molecules are, uh, as uh, small inclusions, which are rigid. Okay, and since the inclusions are rigid, I mean, they hinder the fluid, the fluid flow. So they increase the viscosity. Then you look at this in two, way, two ways. The first way is, well, from far away, I don't see the sugar molecules anymore. So this is an effective fluid. Okay, it's not water, it's water plus sugar, but I call that effective fluid, with some viscosity. And then you change slightly the perspective and you say, oh, but this is some heavy particle in a gas. You have a gas and you have particles. Okay, and so your particles diffuse in a gas. And now it's more like Boltzmann equation. So not Boltzmann equation, but equilibrium. Okay, so here you have a hydrodynamic perspective, and here you have just a fluid dynamic perspective. Here you will, okay. So that's the two things he has in mind. And then in terms of experiment, what can you do? You can measure here, I would call mu the viscosity. Okay, so this would be the viscosity, which you can measure just a viscometer. So what do you do? You take a tank, you put a cylinder, you turn the cylinder at some, at some fixed velocity, and you look at how much uh, force you have to put. Water, you can do that here. I would say it's water plus sugar. That's something you can measure. So you have that, you have that. So that is the same. 
I mean, that's the same system. So it should have the same viscosity. They are equal. Okay, and the game here is to express this in terms of the Avogadro number. This as well. And what do you need to? Because it won't be enough to have the Avogadro number, you will also need the radius of a molecule, which you don't know because you don't know it's an atom. Right? Two unknowns, two equations. You identify them. Right? OK. So let's do that. So you need two formulas. So the first one is the one I will uh, mostly talk about in this talk. That's that one. So you have that. This should be first. OK, so the thing is you don't put much sugar in it. So there, there's not much sugar. But at first order, the viscosity should be the one of the water. You know, if you have a density of sugar lambda, which is very small, the equivalent should be the viscosity of the water. And then you have a correction. And that's the correction, where lambda is essentially the, um, the volume density of sugar, so which you can write as, so that's in 3D, of course, the radius, then the Avogadro number, that's the mass density, and that's the molecular weight. So I just... So these are the two unknowns, this A cube and this Avogadro number. That's the two things people didn't know. And what's important is this, this factor, 5 half. So that's Einstein's factor. And that's universal, in the sense that, see, I didn't make any assumption. Okay or I claim I didn't make any assumptions on how my particles were in the fluid. Right? And actually, that's the, the only... So this is not an identity, of course. I mean, this is, if you like, a Taylor expansion in lambda. And that's only the first term of the Taylor expansion, which depends on nothing. And that's good, because then in the experiment, you don't have to care much. OK, so that's the first, the first formula. It's called the Einstein effective formula for the viscosity. And then the second formula, which is Einstein formula in kinetic theory. And this involves the same two unknowns. Okay, so R now is the constant for perfect gases. T is the temperature, and this is the viscosity of uh, the water. OK, you know that these two are equal, so you can... These two are equal, and you know to what they are equal. OK, that's your measurement. So you can compute this A and this N. And actually, uh, when Jean Perrin did the experiment, what he found is that the Avogadro number is... 656, 10 to the 23. And well, now the Avogadro number is a fixed constant, and we use it to define the mole. But um, if you compare this, actually, the true thing now is so that was within 10%, it was accurate. I mean, 10 to the 23. Okay? OK, so that's what uh, Einstein suggested. These experiments were, were, were done by Jean Perrin. They both got the Nobel Prize for different reasons. And this is somehow quite popular, the, first, the, the second one, the uh, kinetic relation. Right? That's something for which you can prove, find proofs in, the, in mass also for different models. The first one was not that much uh, studied in mass. However, uh, the paper giving that is the most cited paper of Einstein. You might ask the question, why? Why is it the most cited paper? Because it gave rise to uh, a field, a new field, and that new field was complex rheology. 
why complex rheology? You have a fluid, you have something inside, so that's a new fluid. That was the beginning of, uh, of lots of studies. So if you look at the first term, the first term, if you think that the effective viscosity is just given by Einstein's formula, then everything stays Newtonian. But if you look at the second order correction, which I will try to, if I have time, I will explain you a bit about that, then you'll see that uh, it depends very much on the statistics of the point process. Whereas at first order, it just depends on the density. Which means that if you depend on local, uh, on how the particles are arranged, it means that if you have a different forcing term, you will have a different arrangement. If you have a different arrangement, you might have a different viscosity, which means that you're a non-Newtonian fluid. Okay, and so that's the, uh, that was the starting point of all this. Okay, so now I come to the, the aim of the talk. So first thing, I'd like to show you a justification of Einstein formula. <coughs> and when I say justify Einstein formula, I want to assume, okay, to make no assumption, that would be the, the dream. You know, there's no assumption at all on the point process. Well, that's almost the case. But to understand, okay, there's, that's almost the case, there's still something to assume. That's the fact that if you look at the second order, the second order is not as large as the first one. So in some sense, we'll have to understand where does this Einstein uh, formula come from. And what is speaking just comes from the fact that Einstein assumed that if you're in a dilute regime, it means that particles do not see each other. Okay, but you can cook up examples where you're in the dilute regime and particles see each other. Example. Okay, they are very far away, they don't see each other. Okay, but I could assume that each time I have a particle, I have a second one. This is too still dilute, right? But these two particles are close. So you cannot say that they don't see each other. Okay? So that's a typical example where Einstein's formula won't hold. But of course, that's something you can quantify, and that's normal. So this will be something we will fight against. And the key word here would be universality. And the second thing is high order expansion. And for this higher order expansion, I like to capture that. No, I like to be able to describe what's going on at any order. So I have to take care of the fact that sometimes I might have particles which are close to one another. And, and here, of course, that's completely not universal. And part of the question is to identify what are the uh, important properties of the point process in this expansion. So what is the driving quantity in that problem? And that's not given a priori. Okay. So let me start with uh, the Einstein's formula then. So if you want a rigorous uh, If you want something rigorous, there are three things to do. First thing, to write equation. I've just made pictures. What is the model there? The second thing is to define the effective equation, the effective viscosity. I mean. And once you have the effective viscosity, that's to make some kind of Taylor expansion when lambda is small. So that's the three things we have to do. So for the equation, that's uh, so let's start with the equation. So I have a Stokes fluid. 
outside the particle. Okay, so first I will, uh, in this talk, the particles will have size 1. Okay, which means that I'm a very large tank. So first thing, outside the particles, I have the Stokes equation. I will place myself in the whole space, and I call script i the union of all the particles. The particles are just balls in the balls of radius one in this Stokes. Okay, that's Stokes fluid, so I also have that the divergence of u is zero. Again, outside this. Okay, that's not all because I have particles, so I need to uh, tell what's going on in particles. In particles, the in particles, the uh, I have a rigid motion, which means that the symmetric gradient of my velocity is zero. So symmetric gradient, that's just okay. What it means, the symmetric gradient, and if this is zero, this means that grad u is a constant for the skew symmetric matrix. So which means that in each particle, I have that u of x is v plus r of x, and this one is q-symmetric. The thing is that v and r are unknowns, and they depend on the particle where I am. Okay? So if I don't impose additional conditions, the problem is not well posed. I have too many unknowns. So I will impose two uh, conditions and okay, so I should do that. Oh, you cannot do them together. So the two conditions are. Uh, physical requirements, obviously. So the first one is a balance of forces and the second balance of momenta. And that gives me two relations. And actually, you can even see, the, you can even consider the That's that one, right? Yeah. You can consider these two unknowns, V and R, as Lagrange multipliers of two constraints that I'm about to write. the two constraints. So for uh, B which is a particle in I, so for all B I have that I, when I integrate on B uh, the constraint exerted by the fluid on the particle, this is zero. So that's just the average force, force on the particle. And it's zero, and you ask the same thing for the momentum. So I want to work in any dimension, so I... I use that, and that needs to be true for any skew-symmetric matrix. Okay, these are the two conditions. So you have two unknowns, V and R, two conditions. OK, that's fine. Or well, at least uh, formally it's fine. And then you can solve the equation. OK, so that is the equation uh, I have. Now if you, want to define, um, if you want to define an effective viscosity, well, of course, you can rephrase that in terms of homogenization problem. You rescale everything. You let epsilon go to 0. And you wonder what the limiting equation is. Fine. The thing is, I'm only interested here in the 
effective viscosity, so I can uh, motivate a bit the formula we should have for effective viscosity, what should it be? Essentially, you assume that uh, your fluid has infi at infinity has a linear velocity, like e dot x at infinity, and then you look how the things arrange themselves in the middle, and you look at the uh, dissipation you get from that. So essentially, if there is an effective viscosity, which I will call b bar, then b bar will be given in direction e, so e will be uh, symmetric tra ze trace zero. So why? Because b bar will be applied to symmetric gradients. Okay, so that would be a d something, so it will be symmetric. And why does it need to have trace zero? Because the fluid is incompressible, and the divergence of u is nothing but the trace of du. Okay, so that's at infinity, when you're unperturbed, you should be like that. And that should be this should be the limit of the dissipation when um, psi solves a problem similar to that one. It's almost the same. The only thing I ask is that uh, psi e plus e x is a solution of the of this PDE above. So I will change it by adding e's uh, in some places. And the thing is, you shouldn't think as the psi as correct as local correction of the fluid velocity in this complex uh, system. Which means, in particular, that at large scale, what's important is just the e x and psi should not be important at large scale. And that imposes a condition, which is uh, that you can really homogenize if cx divided by x goes to zero at infinity. You like, that's just, that's a correction. That shouldn't be the leading term. The leading term is what you impose macroscopically. And what you impose macroscopically is the ex, not the psi. The psi is just there to, uh, to, to, make, to make your ex a solution, if you like. So the, the equation will be psi e plus e x, but I take a Laplacian that goes away, plus, okay, I have zero because the only thing I impose is that it's linear at infinity. Then diver divergence psi e is zero. So why? Because I want divergence psi e plus e x to be zero, but e has a trace zero, so up, disappears. And then I have that d psi e plus e needs to be zero in the inclusions. And then I have the two conditions. And that you can write by just adding d e. Write nu equals zero. And then the same thing with theta x. So that's the equation which is posed on the whole space outside the inclusions. And from that you expect, so what you want is that the limit when x goes to infinity of this guy is zero. That is another way to say that uh, the solution of your Stokes equation looks like ex at infinity. And at infinity, I repeat, that's macroscopic scale. All right, so this equation can be proved to be well posed. But you need additional condition. So let me explain why. So if I, were dealing, I was dealing with the Laplace equation, so dv grad with a bonded from above and below, that would be just standard. There's here uh, a slight difficulty. That's the rigidity constraint. And let me explain you why. If you have two particles, which are distance h, and we have, on the one hand, uh, some v and r, and on the other hand, a v prime and an e prime. So you know the. Um, Give yourself the values of the rigid motion in both particles and solve the Stokes, equa the Stokes equation outside. Okay? And try to understand 
was the scaling of the solution depending on h. And the problem is that the gradient of the velocity blows up at h goes to zero. So blow up of the grad u when h goes to zero, if these two are, are different. Okay, you can even, uh, you can even characterize the, 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 the blow up rate. And that's slightly, and, and on top of that, you know, as a baby model, you could consider the scalar case. In the scalar case, you can do a lot of things because cutoffs are nice in the scalar case. But in the case, in this case of system, I mean, e, psi is a velocity, so it lives in Rd. Uh, in this case, when you combine it to the, with the divergence-free constraint, the blow-up is even faster. Divergence-free constraint is not nice. Okay, so that's the reason why uh, you have an infinite number of particles. If you don't assume anything on how, on how close they are, then things can get out of hand, right? Okay, however, in dynamical experiments, in 3D, if you let a particle evolve in a fluid, they can touch in finite time. Which means that uh, at some point there's something going on. So particles can touch in finite time, which means that that picture, okay, there's something in that picture. And maybe considering two particles, it's just not the right way to go. In any case, there are three possibilities to, um, three possibilities to, to deal with this issue. The first one, the easiest one, that would be just to neglect that issue. So how would you neglect that issue? You would just say, oh, assume that the particles are at minimal distance rho, whatever the two particles I choose. OK, so it means that that problem never happens. That's the first, that's the first possibility. But that's not nice because you know, in mechanics, in fluid mechanics, you would expect them to be able to touch or at least to be at an, any close distance. So that's not, that's not that nice. OK, second, second, try, so second thing you could try, You've understand, uh, understood correctly this uh, blow-up, blow-up rate. So you know there's a blow-up rate. You can uh, make probabilistic assumptions on the distribution of the distance between a particle and the closest particle. And if that one compensates the blow-up, then you're fine. So in some sense, that's, um, that's just making assumptions on how, how close two particles can be. That's nice, but when you do that, you realize that they can only touch in dimension 5 and more. Which is not what you're interested in, or not completely. So that's not the good one. There's another and a last way to, to proceed. And that is to uh, realize that when you make these assumptions on the distance between two particles, implicitly what you're doing in your uh, estimates, that is uh, essentially a considering the worst case scenario. Two particles are close, and they are close, and they are close, and they are close, and they are close. And so at the end, you, you do not distinguish the fact that maybe if two are close, it means that three are not that close, right? And there's another thing, which is here I've assumed that V and V prime are different, but maybe if they are close, the fluid prefers to make them the same, right? But then, okay, but then how much are they the same? And the problem is that you have a PDE. The PDE might do what it wants, but uh, I mean, it doesn't tell you what it do does, right? And if you want to use bounds, then it might be easier to use a variational approach. I mean, the, the, the gain of a variational approach with respect to the PDE is that in your variational approach, you can make competitors. And you know that the PDE will, do, will always do better than the competitor you come up with. But in order to, to compare your competitor to the true solution, I mean, that's not the PD, using the PD that you will do that. That's more using the energy. So the, the third approach, so first approach was just assume that uh, the distance between uh, so i and i prime is always larger than rho for i, I, for i not i prime in my set of goals. That's the first one. The second one is uh, moment bound assumptions on the minimum distance. 
So typically, um, okay, so I don't want to write them down. So assume that um, okay, and that that would be the the distribution of the distance. So at zero, it's flat. Okay, and the at what order is it flat depends on how smart you were estimating the thing. And that's not a trivial thing, because when you estimate that, I mean, the naive guess would be to take a cutoff in the equation, to put a cutoff. You, know, you have two solutions, you make a cutoff. The cutoff there cannot be radial. So you have to exploit the fact that it's a sphere and that outside of the contact point, you have a lot of room. If you had squares, you know, instead of having spheres, if I had squares, the answer would be different. So you have to use the geometry and the curvature. OK, anyway, so you have this. And the last one, that's uh, this um, variational approach. And for that, I'd like to give you uh, an equivalent formula for the, for the E, for the B bar. And B bar can be given as the infimum of the expectation of of so I assume that E is one. Okay. So that's the expectation of deep C psi. So at the, that's the exp, that's the minimum, but that's the infimum of the expectation of the Dirichlet energy of your psi plus one for psi, which is such that its divergence is zero. That psi uh, plus E x. Okay, so deep psi, deep psi plus E is zero in my inclusions. And such that the expectation of deep psi is zero. Okay, so more speaking, you have everything to prove that result. Uh, damn that I, I erased something. So I had defined, the first thing I did, when I defined B bar in the first, uh, the first time I talked about it, I defined it as the limit when R goes to infinity of the average on a large cube, right? If the solution to that equation is such that its gradient is stationary, then I can use the ergodic theorem to say that it's the expectation. Replacing the limit on large cubes, on averages on large cubes, by the expectation. So for the, for, for the true solution, this is all right. So B bar is actually, the, is actually this for psi solving that equation. And here I'm telling you that actually that's the best you can do. So believe me. And you have to encode the constraint in your space. And that's the good thing because now I don't have to deal with the pressure. I mean, I'm minimizing in a space where anyway I'm diversion free. So I have no constraint any, anymore. And since I have no constraint, I have no Lagrange multiplier anymore. And P is just the Lagrange multiplier of being divergence free. Yes. Yes. So it's not infinite because I'm looking at. So this is a stationary field, right? I'm looking at it at zero. Just one point, yes. So by stationarity, I mean, whatever you look at, the expectation is the same because the statistics of your field is the same. So you cannot distinguish a point. So I choose zero. And oh, yeah, yes. Oh, yes, sorry. Very big assumption. To make this work, you have to assume that your P is stationary and ergodic. So examples, ZD. Uh, Poisson point process. Okay. Anything you like, Gibbs, you know, Poisson, uh, Gibbs point processes, whatever you like. Usually they are constructed to be stationary ergodic. And all I'm telling today could be adapted to locally stationary ergodic. But that, I mean, the, the key is, is that. Okay. So third approach using the, this variational approach. And really speaking, this is convex. This is our semi-continuous for the topology you want. 
So the only thing to show in order to have existence of, okay, that won't be a minimizer. What I will focus on is this deep psi. Deep psi will be uniquely defined. Psi, okay, don't talk about it. Um, the thing is that that, that, that functional is lower semi-continuous for the weak top convergence of the gradient. So the only thing you need to show is that the space on which you're minimizing is not empty. That this inf is finite. So the only thing you need is to build a competitor to show that the space is not empty on which this is finite. And how do you do that? I already give, gave you the clue. When particles are too close to one another, you choose the same v and the same r. So that actually you even, when you have that, you take a, a big ball including the two inclusions and you ask that the v is a rigid body motion there. Okay? But you pay an energy when you do that. Because when you go to the outside of the fluid, then of course you have to go back to the fluid as it wants to be. And uh, when you have two particles which are close to, okay, what, what can happen? You have one, you have two, you're fine. Now imagine you have one, 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 and you make a big, big line of particles which are close to one another. Then look at what the solution looks like. You want it to be a rigid motion, the same one on all your line. It means that it grows linearly along the line. Okay, it's just, a, it's just a linear function then. And when it grows linearly along the line, you're slightly worried because you might not have my condition that psi of, of x divided by x goes to zero at infinity. If the line becomes infinite, then it's just a linear order term. Okay, so what can, could prevent this to hap from happening? Well, assume that you cannot have too many balls close to one another. So what's that? That's a percolation argument. So in order to get finiteness of this, of this infimum, you use subcritical percolation argument. OK, so there are the three ways to, to uh, define correctly your problem. And in the last one, you can have things that touch. Yeah. No? OK. OK, so now I've described uh, how you can uh, define the Effective viscosity, you have three, so two ways to do that. One with the PDE, one with the, um, one with, one with the variational, uh, the variational version. And now I want to uh, show you that that was a good choice to prove the Einstein formula. So I will present the proof of the Einstein formula only uh, for assuming you were in the first case, but actually you can do that in the two other cases. The proof is just a bit more involved. So let's go back to uh, Einstein's intuition. So why, uh, so how did he come up with these five halves? The main idea was to say, well, particles do not see each other, okay, at first order. So I can consider that the effect of a particle around, around that particle is uh, given by the same problem when I'm in the old space was just one single particle. And my particles are balls, you need balls, so that problem can ex actually be solved explicitly in, in spherical coordinates. And the five halves come from the fact that everything's explicit, you make computations and, and you get something. But now, of course, that's, uh, that's one thing to say that particles do not interact, that they, they behave as, as if they were isolated. But, well, the equation does not tell you that. The equation tells you that they are, uh, that they influence each other. That's an elliptic equation, so you have infinite speed of propagation. I mean, you change something somewhere. I mean, that's not the Charles Smart case. I have a unique continuation, right? So things should behave. If you change something somewhere, you should feel it everywhere. So how do you do that? So first you introduce this psi infinity, which is the solution of the one particle problem on the whole space. So I say you're not at zero. Then I ask that d psi infinity plus e equals zero in b. And I have my two conditions on, on db. 
that is well posed. You can solve it explicitly, and what you get as uh, bounds is that uh, psi infinity plus x gradient psi infinity of x. This is less for x larger than 1 or 2, say. So morally speaking, psi infinity is like the gradient of the Green's function of the Laplacian. And why is that? OK, you have something going on in B, of course. So you could think of that being like 1 on the right hand side. That would give you the Green's function. Why an additional gradient? Because of the condition. When you integrate on the surface, it's 0. So that's morally speaking more the divergence of the indicator function. And so the divergence will give you an additional gradient, which means that psi infinity looks like uh, the gradient of the Green's function. And that has a name. It's called the Stokeslet. OK, that's the building block. And then there's a, so Einstein, Einstein compositor is the following. I want to say that around the particle i, I use psi center that, that particle. And far away, I don't know what I do. So what should you do? You should say that when, you're, when you choose a point in space, you look for the closest particle you are to, and you use the deep psi for that particle. So if you think that way, then what you have is if you have your particles, you start by doing a Voronoi tessellation. OK, I won't. So what would be that? Whatever. OK. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> You know what you say in geometry. The art of geometry is to, uh, to make a good reasoning based on the wrong, on the wrong picture. Yeah. OK, so you have, this, uh, you have this point xn. Then I define the Voronoi cell vn. And Einstein, essentially, OK, that's not the way it's written, but that's really what he's doing. He's saying, OK, I'm using d psi infinity, evaluate, uh, evaluate it at so I centered, my, I centered this not at b, but at xn, and multiplied by the indicator function of vn. OK, so that would be Einstein's idea. And two questions. First, does it really give the 5 halves? And second, how far is it from the true solution? So for the 5 halves, well, OK, you can do the computation. So no, that, not that. Uh, what I want is this. Expectation of Einstein's, uh, Einstein's formula, plus 1. This is, um, OK. Now, OK, OK, I didn't tell that. Of course, here. I've taken the, the, the viscosity of the background to be 1. Okay. So, and when you do that, uh, the formula you get is exactly 1. So in dimension, in any dimension, that's actually d over 2 divided by uh, 2 by 2 plus OK, plus this. What's this? And of course, lambda. And the lambda is the volume fractions of both. OK, so what's this question mark? So essentially, uh, the 5 half would be if I would replace the integral on the Vol Voronoi cell by the integral on the whole space. OK, I've cut things I shouldn't have. OK, but that's the only way to make it rigorous. So what's the error of uh, not considering what's outside? Well, look, you take the square of the gradient. The gradient scales like x to the minus d. So you integrate on rd minus the uh, Voronoi cell, something which decays like 2d. OK, so that's essentially the, the error term you make is less than the expectation of the sum of all possible balls of um, 
essentially the first that you're in uh, the particle. And then the error is the, I will call it rho n to the minus d. And the rho n is, to make a picture, is the radius of the uh, inscribed sphere in the, in the Voronoi cell. And that actually is small if you don't have too many closed particles, right? And later on, I will introduce a lambda 2. And the bound is like this. And lambda 2 measures. That's the property of the point process. And that measures how often uh, particles get close together. So that's the first part of, of it. I'm so slow. Um, OK, that's the first part. And then there's the second part. And for the second part, then there's an identity you should use. That's the following one. You want to compare, I want to compare that to the true solution, so to the corrector. And that, how did I define it? I define it on Voronoi cells. So I have to write a formula on Voronoi cells. And this is given by the sum, so the expectation, of the sum over all points of uh, of the indicator function that 0 is in this uh, ball of uh, the integral on the Voronoi cell of d psi. OK, so that's an identity that you can prove. So there are conditions on the point process there. But I put that under the carpet, because at the end, you can do it. So you can, okay, you can do some approximation argument, and it works. So you have that. And now that's fine, because the only thing you need to compare is this. So on each Voronoi cell, you compare that to uh, the thing with the psi infinity. And in order, OK, and you can say, OK, so when you see that the first time, you can wonder how that would help, because you don't know much about the corrector. The psi e depends on all the balls, everywhere, right? Whereas my psi infinity just depends on one ball where it, where, where it sits. And in order to do that, you use a, a variational approach, and essentially, you sandwich that guy uh, between uh, the same with. So essentially, what you do is you sandwich that guy between. Uh, you say that this is less than the energy when you put Dirichlet boundary condition. Because if I impose zero on all these lines, that will give me a competitor for that thing. It will be in that space. So I will be able to say that the energy of that guy must be smaller than the energy of that one. And then I can also here consider Neumann boundary condition. And then the energy of that guy on Vn this time will be obviously larger than the energy on the Neumann pro of the Neumann problem. OK, so if you uh, know uh, the Armstrong math approach for stochastic homogenization, you might think that that's the same. But there's, a, uh, there's an important difference here. This can be done because I have this uh, rigidity constraint. Because for the Neumann problem, it gives me an anchoring. You know, the Neumann problem is not zero, the solution. Because I need to be, uh, because the solution needs to be rigid in some part of the space. And that's why, actually, you can uh, get around with it very easily. And at the end of the day, what remains to be done is to com compare the energy with Dirichlet boundary condition to the energy with Neumann boundary condition for this problem. How do you do that? How do you do that? Well, actually, you compare both of them to that guy. And you use elliptic regularity and so in a fancy way. And when you use elliptic regularity, because essentially outside of the particle, you're like a harmonic function, right? The only thing is that you added the constraint that it's rigid. So you have to take care of that. But by elliptic regularity, essentially what you have is that uh, you, have, you end up with the same bound on the difference. So which means that. Uh, at the end, uh, this is the error we have in Einstein's formula. So if you compare the true homogeneous coefficient to what Einstein's formula gives you, that's the error. And so you have to understand that. And you can, that's something you can do. 
and I will just give you uh, a statement for the next orders, which involves the definition of this lambda 2. So as I told you, this lambda 2 should measure uh, how often uh, particles are close together. So a way to do that is as follow. So you define lambda j of a point process. Now before I define that, I introduced L which is an intrinsic distance in the point process. The intrinsic distance is the inf over all points in my point process of the distance between them. And I assume that this is positive. And actually, I assume that this is larger than 1, which is needed because I put inclusions. And the inclusions cannot overlap, right? So at the, the best you can do is being larger than 1. So in particular, I cannot have a Poisson point process. But that's normal. The Poisson point process is not hardcore. And the definition here is, is, uh, is used for that. And I define this as L minus G, uh, GD inf soup over Z1 ZD of the expectation over the sum of k points, which are disjoint of the indicator function that there's a point in this uh, okay. k, x, and k. Okay. okay, so if you look at what's happening when k equals 1, when k equals 1, I have the soup over just 1. I have a sum over all the points of the, uh, uh, of the indicator function that the point I've chosen is in the uh, cube of size L centered at Z. By stationarily, Z plays no role. That's only true for the first one. So I will have no soup in here. And then what I will have is just the size of the cube times the intensity of the, of the point process but I've divided by L to the D, so I will recover the usual intensity of the point process. So what am I doing that? Because we were kind of struggling to put the periodic setting inside. And that way it holds for the, for the periodic setting, the, the J's uh, density, intensity, the, the intensity of order J of your point process K is like L to the minus G D as it should. Okay. Well, so when you have that, then what you can, uh, show about the viscosity, the effective viscosity, is that there exists a sequence of B bar J, where B bar J only depends on interactions between G, J particles. So Einstein's, Einstein's assumption is that you could consider them isolated, so it, one by one. And then it's natural to assume that at order two, you will consider two body interaction, that at order three, three body interaction, etc. So you can define them, and they are well defined. And then what you have is that BJ bar, if you look at how it scales, it scales like lambda j times the log j minus one lambda j. And if you look at the difference, B bar minus the uh, sum of the lambdas of the bj's, it's like a Taylor expansion, up to k, then what you get is lambda, so a sum over j between k plus 1 and 2k of the same thing. Lambda k plus 1, log lambda j, sorry, log j minus 1 lambda. So that's what you get. So that's a generalization of ancient formula at any order. The only thing is that the BJ now depends very much on the low 
of the point process because it sees how two points, the geometry of, of two points, of J points, say. And, uh, okay, so to conclude, let me just uh, tell you why, uh, why there's a logarith uh, logarithm here. So first of all, the logarithm is optimal. So you can always find examples for which it's saturated. Second, uh, sometimes it's not there. So when is it not there? When two examples? When in so here, this is about dilute problems. And there are simple ways to dilute uh, point processes. The first one would be you erase points at random, according to Bernoulli variable, and then you don't see the logarithm. Or the other one is when you uh, dilate them. So you extend the length, and then there's no logarithm either. And why is uh, this problem subtle? That's because of the decay of this function psi. You know, the Stokeslet's decay is at x to the minus, minus, sorry, the gradient, which, what is interesting, that's the gradient. The gradient of the Stokeslet uh, decays like x to the minus d. This is not integrable, right? So you have, uh, you have a problem there. And in order to define, even to define them, the, the, this bj, the bj's, so they are obtained by so-called cluster expansion, and they are given by infinite sums, which are not absolutely converging. So you have to show that you can give a meaning to, this, to these guys, and essentially that's quite close to having a calzaron zygmunt operator. You know, when you put absolute values, it does not converge, but if you let, uh, let the theory do it for you, then there are compensations, right? The problem here is that your calzaron zygmunt operator, you don't know it very well, it depends on so many particles as, I mean, that's not something very explicit. And still you have to, uh, to understand that. So the fact that it's not, so the fact that there's logarithm is uh, reminiscent of the fact that you are borderline non-integrable. If instead of having this thing, I add this, you know, if at the end of the day, I would have had that psi, that grad psi is case like minus d minus epsilon, then I will have no logs. And it would be much easier to prove. And then there are two routes to, to obtain that. The first route is to, so everything is about renormalization, to understand why your sum is finite, whereas when you put absolute value, it's not. And so there are uh, two, two, two paths you can take for that. The first part is to do some implicit renormalization. And for that, you just go around the problem. And that's based, the, the input there is, uh, quantitative stochastic homogenization as one of them, and uh, new L1, L2 estimate, which are actually the crux of the thing. This should be seen more as a quantitative approximation result. Because what you do is you do the thing on the finite box, and you want to uh, let the size of the box go to infinity. And in order to really be able to use what you do here, you need a rate. And that's what this gives you. And the second route is explicit normalization, renormalization. That's something that was done in physics for the first. So for the, for the first one, Einstein's formula, it's pretty clear. It's hidden there. You know, it's hidden there because uh, I've used the quadratic form here. Whereas at the beginning, it was the expectation of deep psi plus e squared, right? And if you expand that, you have deep psi squared plus two d psi plus e squared. e squared gives me one, and d psi, which has borderline decay, is not integrable, but d psi at zero expectation. So in any approximation, suitable approximation will do, that would disappear. So at first order, that's trivial. At second order, it's not trivial. You know, Einstein's paper, that's 1905, and the, second, the, the renormalization for the second term, that's in the 70s, and that's bachelor. And that's using also some nice cancellations. And so at higher order, you have to do that too. And that was much more subtle. And that, uh, and that we also did. And the key here is to use the diagrammatic, diagram diagrammatic uh, integration. And there's uh, there are some advantage to take this, this approach. Your convergence rates are much better. And you really understand what's going on. Uh, you know why the thing is well defined, whereas here it's more a compactness argument. So that compactness versus constructive argument. 
And I think I will just stop there, but I have to give you a couple of names I didn't cite. Uh, so on, on Einstein's formula, they were worked by Enz and Matsukato, then uh, also by David Gerard Varet and Mathieu Hilleret, then with Richard Hofer, uh, Barbara Nithammer, Richard Schubert, and for the second order, so k equals 2, that was also Gérard Varé, Hilleré, Gérard Varé, Mécherbé. OK. Mécherbé. This approach with uh, the Voronoi tessellation is slightly, OK, might not, seem sli might not seem simpler, but it is fundamentally simpler and much closer to Einstein's point of view. And that's the only one to allow you to have touching particles. And also, the nice thing is that uh, for the first time, we know precisely what the, what the error term. So the error term is optimal because it coincides with the term of the next expansion, the next term of the expansion. And I think um, I will stop here. How easy or how hard can it be to calculate those lambda j's? To calculate the lambda j's for let's say, typical distributions you might be interested in? OK, so for typical distribution you're interested in, then that's so I will, or two answers. If that's the typical ones you know, like if it's a Poisson point process or a hardcore Poisson point process, that would be the intensity to the power j. If it's something that you dilate, then it will be just the, the dilation to the power d. And otherwise, that's more the other way around. You construct things so that they have this thing. And that was something I didn't talk about, but you can, this lambda j, they do not decrease necessarily. And you can construct uh, many examples where you have, so more speaking, lambda j plus 1 is, is larger, that, no, smaller than lambda j, and larger than lambda j times lambda. And in between, you can have all the powers you like. And, and it's really easy to construct examples. So that's, I mean, there's a full zoology of, uh, of things. <laughs>